I'm Melanie Nichols. I publish under my initials, M.A. Nichols, and um, as mentioned, I'm the moderator, and I write historical romance. And we'll just go through the, down the row, and a little introduction about yourself, whatever you want to say. All right. Um, my name is Kiri Taylor. Um, I'm a USA Today bestselling author of about 32 titles right now. Um, I've written just about every version of romance you can write, from my most well-known for paranormal romance. I've also done sci-fi romance, contemporary, young adults. Um, so yeah, I've I've done a lot of different kinds of romance. So. Hello, I'm Shannon Camp. Um, I all of a sudden forgot everything in my whole entire brain. Um, I write young adult and new adult fiction, um, like paranormal romance. I write dystopian. Um, I like to write about gaming a lot. That is my job is to write for SVG.com about video games. So I like to put gamers in my books and make them fall in love. <laughs> my name is Brenda Stanley, and I write uh, YA and women's uh, fiction. Uh, I am also a cookbook author, best-selling cookbook author, and I will have all my cookbooks and fiction at the book signing tomorrow night, so forget the film festival, come on. <laughs> Are you going to cook us anything? Like, will you cook I, something? Honestly, I would love to cook for you. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'm also the mother of five children, including two sets of twins. Oh, so oh, if you nice. want really quick, easy, good things, come see me. <laughs> Everyone gasped. Yes. That yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, Not a prude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jenny Stevens. Um, I'm an editor. Um, I edit um, both science fiction and fantasy, but also a lot of historical um, romance. So I edit a lot of Regency, a lot of uh, Victorian, and I know a lot about how to do the little hand touches is like as good as sex, okay? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what my experience. Okay. Well, to kick it off, um, let's just start by talking about what are the basic elements of good romance? Like, what makes a good s romantic story? Are there s basic plot points that they need to hit in order to be able to make a satisfying romance, just in general? <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel like what I expect in real life is not what I want necessarily in a book. Because for me, I'm like, oh, in real life, I want to be comfortable around some, you know, I want to like have that nice, comfortable, let's watch a movie and be in our sweats. But then when I'm writing, I'm like, oh, but it has to be like butterflies and tension and like, you know, so much like, oh, every time I see them, my heart flutters. But in real life, I'm like, I don't want my heart to flutter. I just want to watch Netflix in my sweat. So <laughs> I think like maybe in my books, I tend to lean more towards that like tension between the characters. I, I think that word is a good word. I think tension is, is something that, I think when you think back to when you were young and those first um, feelings of, of love and what you think I think is love um, is what you want, you know, even now, you know, I mean, even now that I'm a grandma, I think about those things back then, and I look at my daughter, or granddaughter that's 11, and I think her, she looks at these boys and all that. That's what you're thinking about, is that young, that first love, and I think that's a lot of it, and that tension is because you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know what you're going to think, and so I think that has a lot to do with that. It's exciting. It is. It's exciting. Um, I feel like as far as plot points go, you always want to start with like a really good meeting. Um, mm -hmm. They call it a meet cute in some places, but just, um, and it, it could be that your characters already know each other, but you need to establish their rapport really early on. Um, and I always find it's best, I, I struggle with the miscommunication trope. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's, it, when a, something can be so easily fixed with one conversation, it can really frustrate your reader. Um, so I prefer conflicts where they kind of have to work together to solve a problem, and that brings them closer together. Um, and whatever your conflict is, whatever is keeping them apart should be resolved by the end, and that's kind of how you get your neat, wrapped up story that doesn't happen like that in real life. But when you're reading a book, you really want that closure of their relationship of they're going to be, you know, they'll have struggles in the future, but I know they're going to be okay. And you want to end on that kind of optimistic note. 
I think some of my favorite romance is the kind of romance that grips you by your stomach and keeps dra dragging you along for a long time. Like, it works really well in television. We see this all the time with romancey kind of stuff on television. Like, they keep getting interrupted every time they try to kiss. And it really annoys <laughs> us as a watcher, but man, it keeps us coming back every single week. So as frustrating as it can be for a reader, I think it works really, really well in dragging a reader along. So I, I definitely... I definitely appreciate those kinds of stories that can kind of keep you pulled in, and those are the kind of kinds of books that you you can't put down because man, you sure just has to make it to that first kiss when it's finally going to happen. So yeah, grip you by your stomach and keep dragging you along. <laughs> oh, um, also, if you are going to have those tropes in your book. Because I have one, I've got my Paranormal Romance Parish, where the two, it's like, if you would just sit down and talk and be like, hey, I like you, is that okay? But they do have that conversation, so you have to find a way to, like, make that trope work for you. So, like, they have this conversation several times, but the guy is just a huge weirdo and doesn't pick up on, like, social cues <laughs> and things like that. So they have to keep having that conversation. So if you're going to use a trope, make sure that you change it and make it work better for your story. Um, one of the things that I notice with romance is that it's really contingent on the hero and heroine. How do you make engaging her heroes and heroines that you actually care about getting that happily ever after? Um, because honestly, I know as a reader, uh, my love of a romance is usually hung on that. If I don't care about whether or not they get together, I, I you know, what's the point? Mm -hmm. So how do you write engaging heroes and heroines that suck the readers in. Pass it on down. I was actually going to mention this because I feel like what's really going to have your reader get invested more than the plot, more than the setting, more than anything else is just who your two lead characters are. And um, making them not as likable as possible, but you do want to have relatable characters that your reader can put themselves into. Um, that uh, that even when there is a conflict between them, they kind of have complementary flaws and characteristics that um, make the other per like challenge the other person, make them think differently than they did before. And so you can't and so you can't just have your your two main characters. You also have to have like the third character of who it is of who they are together, if that makes sense. Um, and so when your character is alone, they um, might display these characteristics when your two characters are alone, but when they're together, they are almost like this new entity. Um, and so you can do that in a lot of different ways, but I would say that being very relatable and having complementary um, flaws and thought processes is probably a good bet. I think you make such an incredibly good point. I, I think your character development before you go into this relationship is, is so critical. You know, to develop those, those people as individual personalities that have their, all, you know, their own story coming into that relationship first uh, makes your reader care about those people and what's going to happen to them and then start that um, that relationship between those two people. I think that's really what's going to bring that reader into that book and make them care about those people. So, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah, and along with having them have their own story, um, maybe, I'm just kind of, I'm weird, so I write weird characters, but like, I really like to make sure I know my characters probably to an unhealthy point where I'm like, I'm listening to playlists that I made just for them. Like, they're not even the main character. I just want to make sure that I know them well enough that when they interact with each other, it's like, well, I already know what they're going to say. Like, I know how they relate to each other because I know each character. Um, so maybe don't be as weird as me. But it is helpful <laughs> to, like, get into their head a little bit in a non, like, secret window way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the most successful romances that you read about is the characters, they grow when they're together, and sometimes they don't always necessarily grow for the best. 
You know, in relationships, people bring out the best and the worst in each other. So that's one way that you're creating a lot of tension and conflict, conflict and plot in your book is when people don't always bring out the best in each other and they get into sticky situations where they don't always act, I'll do anything for you, I'll, you know, I'll die for you, but no, 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 no. Sometimes the people need to fight. <laughs> like, they need to, they need to show reality. And so I think no matter what happens, you need to have growth where the characters aren't necessarily the same at the, at the end as they were in the beginning. But they've they've grown together and they've kind of made each other evolve as the story is evolving as well. Uh, you guys have mentioned tension a lot. That that of course is one of the keys for any good book. Um, how do you build that tension specifically in conservative romance? That you know, chaste romance, clean romance, sweet romance, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, how does that is that do you build that differently than in the mainstream romances that that feature sex? We've got a sh head shake over there, so mm -hmm. we'll head, head pass down that direction. Well, I think um, when you have a book that ultimately, like, when there's sex, especially explicit sex in a novel, I feel like that's it changes the dynamic so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to figure out where to put that and how it's going to change your characters and how it's going to um, to change their interactions. And so I, I, I do feel like, and this is obviously an overgeneralization, but I do feel like it loses a little bit of the tension because before that, there's always just a little bit of a, not well, yeah, well, they won't they, <laughs> um, where it's like, how, how are they going to navigate the physical aspect of their relationship when um, I feel like a lot of times, and again, this is overgeneralization, but in um, modern romance, um, it's really easy to jump into sex and then go from there. Whereas in a cleaner, that's not a great word, but you know yeah. what I mean. Chase, um, clean, yes. sweet, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a book where they don't automatically have sex, you have a little bit more of that what are they going to do? What are they comfortable with doing? Um, how are they going to approach this? Um, not as if it's end game, but a little bit like it's end game. Mm -hmm. um, and so it changes kind of how you write and how they interact, I think. To, to a point, it almost it takes it where it's like, eh, and then, eh. uh, do you know what I mean? I mean, think about Ross and Rachel. I mean, th that just that build up, build up, it was so much more fun before. You know, the the romance was just so much more exciting, and then after after they did it, it was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, it wasn't as as exciting. Right. And I think that that's part of what's fun about the clean romance is the fact that the, it's it really is much more. Um, there is more tension to it because it just seems like it's just building, building, building. And I, I think that's why I enjoy it. It's more challenging. I think it's actually a, a lot more challenging to write um, YA and, and cleaner romance because it is it, it is challenging to find those ways to bring that in um, in in a way that's that's not going to be just flat out there. So I, I actually quite enjoy that part of it. Um, so in my paranormal romance, I haven't actually said whether, because the characters are together now, spoiler alert, it's okay, there's a lot of them, um, <laughs> but I haven't actually said if they've slept together or not, and I don't even intend to, because I feel like with the tension in their relationship, it's not even so much, I mean, it is very physical, but it's not even so much like, oh, have they slept together? It's like putting them in these different situations and then seeing how they as a couple or as a romantic couple interact in those situations. I mean, usually those situations involve ghosts and things, but um, you know, like I feel like that's where a lot of the tension in their relationship comes from is they're put into all these different scenarios and these different situations and it's kind of like, okay, how are they gonna interact now, now that they're a couple compared to when they weren't before, um, more than like where, where they are physically in their relationship, I guess. So this is where you definitely need to make sure you know your characters very well and you need to make sure that your plot is very strong because if you have like an erotica novel, you know what you're to expect out of that, right? You're gonna, they're heavily relying on the physical aspect of it and the heat of it. Where if you're writing more of a cleaner 
type of romance, then you need more to fill your pages than just lots of time between the sheets, obviously. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is where you need to make sure you understand your characters very well, and you need to make sure that your characters have a real relationship that is not just the physical, because otherwise people are gonna, they're gonna start to get bored eventually. So make sure you have an extremely strong plot and make sure you have very strong defined characters. Uh, Again, going back to tension, because again, that keeps bring, being brought up in a, 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 over and over again. How do you build tension in a sweet romance without the sexual tension side of it, that fo fixation on um, sex? But I mean, because you have those feelings, you have the emotional feelings, but with most chase romances, it's not the focus of their, their love, really. I mean, it's, it's something that eventually will happen at some point behind closed doors, but it's, it, how do you build that ten tension? Um, what have you found that works for building up that, that tension and that um, anticipation without going into heating bosoms and <laughs> bulges and that kind of stuff? <laughs> yes, I went there, okay. <laughs> you just watch a Korean drama so and like, <laughs> Down this uh, just kind of a note on that, like pretty much if, if you have a wide audience, no matter what, somebody might be disappointed in your level of heat in the book. Mm -hmm. Like you really can't, you can't satisfy everyone is the reality. So I mean, just being upfront with how you market your book is, is definitely good because everybody is going to want some different degree of heat in the book. You know, some people are just going to expect that every paranormal romance is going to have some really hot sex scene in it, and that might not be the case. And so just just know that you're not going to... I don't want to say please, everyone, because that sounds really bad to say right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, but some people are going to have different expectations. And so I, I say write what makes you feel good and what ma makes you squirm a little bit to your squirm level you're comfortable with. Yeah. And so, sorry, I'm saying all these really weird things right now. I don't know how I say it without just sounding really awkward. But this is a panel about sex. It, right? Yeah, it kind of is when you get down to it. I'm so. going to take all of your like clips out of context and just post it. I have my reputation. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> and so anyways, just, just write, I think, what makes you feel good. What's making you for? What's making you come back to writing this manuscript? You know, like, if it doesn't make you want to come back to this relationship, then it's probably not going to work for the reader either. For the reader either. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm worried about talking about my cookbook, The Zucchini Houdini, right now. Um, because, <laughs> take it out of context. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Sorry. And that's um, all I needed. <laughs> actually, um, one thing that I, I've learned is that use your senses. I mean, th that's one thing that um, I find. You have all these senses. You've got, you know, what you're looking at. You know the shape of somebody's arms. You know their the color of their hair. The you know all those things. You've got your you know sense of smell. You have um, it, your touch. You know, and it doesn't have to be you know so much sensual touch, but just the light touch of you know accidentally touching somebody when they reach for something. Or you know, there's all those things that um, come from just the senses of how you. You know, when you look and somebody catches your eye or whatever, there's there's all those things that you can take um, and write about and expound upon that can can be used um, in a non you know sensual way that can be sensual. And yeah. I think that that's um, one thing that you know in in my novels, and I write. I mean, like I said young adult. I also write um, stuff that's that's much more adult. And yeah, I still use that in the um, in my women's fiction that is a little more racy. Um, and I think that it works just as well there. So, you know, think about that. Use, use your senses. That's what we do in, in real life, too, when we are attracted to somebody. That's what it is. You smell things, you feel things, you touch things. That's That's what it's all about. So when you're talking about tension and you're taking away the sexual tension, I feel like what you're left with is the emotional tension. And if the emotional tension is not there, the physical tension or the physical tension is not going to matter. 
Um, like, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to see, like, two attractive people kissing each other, and it's another to really be in their heads and be in that moment with them. Um, that sounds really weird, but there you go. Um, and I, but I like what you were saying about, about senses, because I feel like your senses act differently when you're in a romantic moment than when you're not. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, I feel like our attention is kind of here. Um, when we're talking to people and when we're meeting somebody, you know, we're, we're, we're aware of a lot of stuff that's going on around us, and we're aware um, of things. But when you get into a romantic, emotional moment with somebody, it kind of feels like everything tunnels and you just see that person and you just notice things about them that you would never notice but your but your brain and all your chemicals are going and so you notice these micro things you notice like a tiny little mole that you didn't realize they had or or you notice a way that they smell that brings back a childhood memory that you never would have associated with with them so there it is did you hear it <laughs> that's my singing thing i missed a note because i'm nervous um <laughs> i uh and so I feel like when you're in that moment with somebody, it, it's just such a different feeling. So I feel like when you're writing, going in and out of those moments can build that emotional tension. Mm -hmm. um, I also think like focusing on things that were exciting to you when you very first start a relationship, or even before that, when you just like somebody, um, I feel like focusing on those things can really help because little things like, oh, we're all going to the movies and I just sit like next to them in the car as we drive there. Like mm -hmm. that's exciting when you are first meeting someone or you first, you know, start to like somebody. Um, and if you write it correctly and really focus on that feeling of excitement, it can be enough, especially right off the bat, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That just reminded me. So um, I was a huge. Um, Twilight fangirl about mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Nobody judge me. <laughs> um, oh, I'm judging. <laughs> but I felt like that scene when they're watching like the video in class and they're just right next to each other and they can, they're like so aware of each other. <clears throat> that was so like, to my adolescent mind, that was so much more exciting than like the scene later in the books where they have sex. Yeah, exactly. um, so I feel like that yeah. sort of electrical charge between two people who, who just sort of like each other and they're just starting is awesome. And in places, you know, where you are, think about where you are, the, the, the light, you know, is it hazy, is it, you know, where you, the, where you are, be aware of where you are, write things, you know, as you're here at this conference and you have some downtime, just sit there and write about what you're seeing, where you are, focus on those things, and you might use it someday in something, you know, write about where you are, what you're doing, always be aware of those things, and it may come, it may come to you later. Since you brought up Stephanie Meyer, that actually it makes me think about how do we handle sex and relationships in modern society? Because it, modern society mostly expects sex as part of a relationship. And you know, Stephanie Meyer handled it by spending a lot of time talking about why they're not having sex. Yeah. Um, and to the point where, I mean, I read Twilight and I got, I got really tired of it. It felt like it wasn't a clean book at the point because it gets so fixated on sex. Mm -hmm. um, how do you handle sex in modern settings? And you know, do you need to address it? Or can you just ignore it? I know you mentioned that you just kind of don't mention it. But I mean, one, but I have oh, another they, one where I do talk about OK, it. well, then I'm curious. How do you oh. handle it? We're just going to handle it right over to you, because I'm, I'm oh, curious yeah. about this. Um, so the paranormal romance one where I don't like mention if they have or not is because it's I don't know. It's it's like a new adult, and so if they were going to and I was going to talk about it, it would probably need to be a little more explicit. Um, but in a book I have, or a book series I have where they do sleep together, it's actually an LDS fiction series. That sounds weird to be like, oh, my like more adult one, they don't sleep together. At least I'm not going to say. But this LDS one, they sleep together. <laughs> um, but because it's written for an LDS audience, it's like just kind of assumed that until this character gets married, they're probably not going to sleep with anyone. And she gets in a relationship with someone who's not. And so she kind of just brings that up. And it is like a point in there. Um, but then she does eventually end up getting married. And it was I was really nervous. I was like, I don't want, because it's still an LDS audience, and they're not, you know, they're going to be like, oh, some people are going to be like, well, 
where is that scene? Like, they're supposed to sleep together, and other people are like, you can't write about that, it's LDS fiction. Um, my mother-in-law. So, <laughs> she gets mad if people are kissing in my books. I'm like, well, don't read Parrish, because you're not going to like that. Um, but, yeah, so I, I kind of approached it from a realistic point of view of two virgins who have no idea what they're doing, where it's just like, okay, this is probably gonna be a little awkward, that's okay, and I I do skip over the actual, you know, scene, um, but I was, I tried to be realistic with it, you know, as, because sex is not, like, the movies, it's, like, gonna be awkward, you know? I mean, maybe not, maybe I'm just an awkward person, maybe I should stop talking right now. <laughs> I don't know, I'm the virgin on the panel, so, oh, you, you know. know. But, I mean, you know, you throw two versions together, it's like, What's going to happen? No one knows what they're doing. I'm really going to just leave right now. Anyways, <laughs> it's okay. I do skip over the actual scene. I'm so embarrassed right now. Um, but I talk about it, and I address it, and I address the fact that it, you know, is kind of awkward if both of you have waited because you're both like, okay, well, what do we expect? You know, so I, I just came right out and addressed it. But, yeah. I'm going to stop talking. Don't give me the mic again. <laughs> so she hands it to me. I'm going to hand down there she um, I think each book is going to have its own needs. Um, you know, I've written a whole bunch of different series, and with each one, I mean, they all have romance, they all have a relationship, but each one has kind of had a different need. And honestly, the longer I've written, the less I explain of why they're not having these explicit on-page scenes or at all until certain points in their relationship. Um, I used to explain a lot more why certain characters don't do certain things, you know, but now honestly, like, I, I don't necessarily care to have to explain myself. Like, these are these are my characters. I'm going to do what I want with them in, in the book. Um, and I think that some readers are looking for books that don't have a lot of explicit, explicit stuff in them, you know, like, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us are LDS, and some of us, you know, are in book clubs or whatnot, and, like, I don't even know what books to suggest anymore these days. <laughs> like, it's really, really difficult, you know, and so I think that some readers are just okay with it, and yes, I have gotten some bad reviews before saying, you know, why weren't they ever doing it, you know, well, this was kind of weird, why didn't they just jump into bed and get some of these things over with, but I would say that's not the majority of readers that are wanting and expecting that necessarily. I think I think it's a breath of fresh air to some readers that not everything is that way that it has to be so explicit. So I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. Anyone down this direction? I, I said don't give me the mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not gonna be as awkward this time. Um, it kind of is like how you're saying you know your characters and you can do what you want with them. Because um, none of my characters, I've got 13 books out right now and none of my characters curse. I think one of them said hell once in like one book. <gasps> I know. And it wasn't even as a curse word. She was actually like, talking about hell. Um, but like, none of, right? none of them curse. And only one series that I have has LDS people in it. The rest, they're not LDS. Um, and so it could seem really weird, like, well, why aren't they cursing if they're not LDS? Like, that seems odd. But I just... I change. It's like when you aren't sure how to use a word properly in a sentence, so you just rearrange the whole sentence to like avoid that word and not have to use it. <laughs> That's kind of what I do with like, okay, well, how would this character react if they were probably going to curse in this situation? Well, then maybe I'll just have them, you know, like say something completely different, maybe something ridiculous, like they'll make some weird analogy or something, you know, but like rearranging what your character would do and setting up that expectation from your audience. I feel like with cursing is kind of the same with sex. It's like, okay, we don't have to talk about it, even if you're like, probably if I saw this character and like, you know, dropped a brick on their foot, they would they would curse, you know, but it kind of sets up the expectation for what to expect in the book. Did I redeem myself from that really yeah. awkward? I, I think you need to write what you um, feel good about. I think that's very important. I, you need to write, um, don't write what you think other people are going to want. I, I think that's really important. Um, write what you enjoy. For, for a long time, there was this, you know, formula writing, trying to, to write to make, you know, because people wanted to write to make money or whatever. And yeah, you know, sure, you want to quit your day job and, and go, you know, become a full-time writer or whatever, and everybody's got that wonderful dream. But 
write what you're passionate about. Write what makes you happy. Write what you like to read. And I think that the majority of you are in this room right now because the books that you like to read are probably the ones that don't have blatant sex all over the place. And so obviously you're here because you like to read stories that are, you know, romance stories that don't have all of that. So there are other people in the room that probably like to read that as well. And so write what you enjoy reading. That's what I do. I write what I enjoy reading. So stick with what makes you happy. And don't write just because you think somebody else is going to pay for it. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, a good way to, to make yourself happy eventually. Yes, I do write a lot of stuff because I need to make a living. Um, but that's, you know, that's fine. Also write what you really enjoy. And that's what I stick with with my novels. I can't speak too much to modern stuff because I mainly do historical. And in historical books, I mean, obviously, there was still sex, but it had a much different uh, role in the society. Um, and so, um, but like even Jane Austen, there exactly. were characters in her books that had sex and got pregnant. And, um, and they played a different role than they would now. Um, but it was definitely still there and it was something that she had to address because it was something that happened. Um, and so I feel like in modern books, you, you actually can ha let your characters have sex. Like, I think it's totally fine, but if you, want it, if you don't want an explicit scene, there are so many ways to write around that. Um, you can write, you know, just kind of say, and they were going to spend the night together, and then skip to the next morning, or, um, and, or they could be talking about it after the fact, and maybe like, talking about some of the ramifications of it, maybe one person thought that it wasn't as special as the other person did, or something like that. You can, ha you can have the impact there without necessarily showing the very crude term of pink parts. <laughs> um, but I think that that's, that's, yeah. that's, if you do want, if you do want to acknowledge that, you know, this is a modern time and there's probably going to be sex somewhere in your character's relationships, there are ways around it without having to write explicit scenes. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Okay, and frankly, I'm asking this question is purely for selfish reasons because I'm curious about this because I write historical romance because I personally don't want my characters sleeping around and I like the fact that it's very easy to get away with that because it was part of the society even though there were people who weren't. What about doing, say, you know, urban fantasy or, you know, the, the adult paranormal romance or, frankly, modern... Doing modern romance that isn't either YA or Christian or the Hallmark style bubble gum thing. If you want to do a realistic or, you know, style of romance, is there a way to handle that with your your characters remaining chaste without either I don't know drawing big attention to it or turning off readers? You know, like because it, honestly, it is an ex expectation, especially like I love paranormal romance and I love urban fantasy. And most of them do have sex of some sort in them. And I mean, it is, is it, I mean, I, gosh, this is really coming out weird. I'm so sorry. Is it realistic to think that you can write a, a gritty adult modern book without addressing it in some form? Um, I would say, yeah. I, I think that's, um, that's maybe like a very specific niche. But I do feel like there are things you can do if that's your ultimate goal. You can write around it. You can just have maybe a reason why they don't want to have sex. Maybe they um, had a traumatic experience in their past and they're not ready. Or maybe, they, maybe they're asexual and they, they don't want, that's not something that is part of their core values. Um, and so I think there are ways that you could kind of sidestep it um, without, you know, I think there are definitely modern reasons why people choose not to have sex. Maybe the relationship during the book isn't quite to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you start it out and it doesn't get, I mean, it's exciting, it's, it moves along, but it doesn't quite get to that point. Um, you know, there, there, 
other parts of the story that move quicker than, than that. Um, I think there are ways of doing that. I also write historical because I like other parts of the story, and I think you can write the romance in there without having to lead to that. But I, I do th think there are ways. I think that um, there are other parts of stories that are probably more exciting that you can bring into that and steer away from that, possibly. But if you're it's writing, hard. yeah, if you're writing fantasy and you've got like werewolves and stuff. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. a little more interesting than sex. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Um, so I do write paranormal romance, and it's for an older audience. It's not YA. Um, and I've, I've been told by, like, my critique group and, like, my readers and things like that that it's, like, the steamiest of all my books, which is funny because there isn't any sex in it. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for paranormal romance, but no sex. So I won't say it's clean because there's kissing and stuff like that, but perish. <gasps> I know. Uh, <laughs> gasp. Um, but first of all, one of the big things is that there it's a group of ghost hunters, and there's four of them, so they're very rarely alone because they have to sleep in hotel rooms all together, like on the floor usually. Cause, it kind of kills yeah. the mood. It kind of kills the mood a little bit. <laughs> Although they do find times. They find times to be alone. Um, but also just, um, I don't know, just making other things exciting. Like, it can still be steamy without like, oh, here's some explicit sex for you. You know, like a kiss or something can be like pretty, apparently pretty steamy. I, mean, I don't know. I was like, I didn't think it was that steamy, is it? But you guys be the judge. <laughs> Again, this is just where your plot and your your characters just need to be strong. I mean, they, they need to stand outside of just, you know, having to have sex in this. Um, I had another thought that I was going to share on it, and, you know, I hear your thoughts just kind of disappear, you know? But, yes, they do. <laughs> um, but I think it's absolutely possible. I mean, readers like variety. I mean, eventually they get kind of sick of reading the same thing over and over and over and having the same expectations, so kind of shaking up their expectations of you know what they'd expect in a certain genre that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, this is actually something that I've worked on a lot throughout my entire career. I've been publishing for nine years now and everything has been some sort of romance, but I never wanted to write erotica. I never wanted to write all this explicit stuff in it, but that's kind of what heavily dominated the genres that I wanted to write in. And so like there certainly was some bad reviews in the beginnings that this wasn't what they expected, you know, it's not what they were hoping to get out of it, you know, that they wanted a little bit more adult stuff. But it's, this is something that I've worked on really hard over the years to this is I've established established this as my brand. You know, I, I I call myself all the time and this is something my assistant throws out there all the time when we're working on marketing stuff, is I'm a, a PG thirteen author. You know, I I don't I wish there was ranking for books, you know? Like yes. I wish there was certain rankings so you knew what to expect going into there and so it's something that I've I've thrown out there with my name all the time as I am a PG-13 author you know I'll, I'll write some fade to black or you know I'm not gonna have explicit th scenes in here and yeah you might get some swearing out of my books but you're not gonna be littered with f-bombs all the time so it's kind of just something that I have really owned and work really hard to own over the years is you know what you can expect from my kind of romance That's good. Oh, that was really good. No, you yeah. can, keep, you can talk I, as I much as you talking. want. But um, I, I had a publisher at one point who their main thing that they did was erotica. I actually didn't know that when I signed with them. Um, and it was mine was like a dystopian young adult series. Um, and so I did get a lot of reviews like, okay, well, this is what we expect from this publisher. Like, why is there not all of this super mm. explicit stuff going on? But I feel like... Not a lot, not always, but sometimes if you've built the tension really well and you're focusing really well on those more innocent moments, it can almost cheapen, I don't know. I, I don't want to say this is always the case in people who write like really explicit stuff, but sometimes if you don't focus enough on the preliminary, you know, like, oh, they touched my hand, it's so exciting, I'm sitting next to them in the car, um, then it can almost cheapen the relationship if you just jump straight into that and make everything so explicit, then it's like, okay, well now what? Like, we don't have a base, like a base relationship, we just have this. And, um, yeah, I'm not no. saying anybody's doing a bad job. If they're doing that, I'm just saying it might it's a help different a little expectations bit. Yeah, different, different expectations. Yeah. Thank you. Take this away from me. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Like, yeah. I'd love to open it up to you guys. I don't know if we've covered everything or... I mean, we can still keep talking, but I just figured I'd ask if there was... I saw a hesitant hand over there. Um, when it comes to romance novels, how do you feel about love triangles? 
Uh, to them. So in case you guys can hear, she asked about our feelings on love triangles. I'm going to start down this end. <laughs> it can be an unpopular opinion, but I love a love triangle. I don't do it, thank you. I don't care what anyone love says. I like I've, them. I've definitely written them in the past. I mean, I talked in the beginning about, you know, grabbing you by the gut and dragging you along. Like, a love triangle does that real well. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. as long as you're up front and you're marketing about it, if there's a love triangle in it, then great. A lot of readers love them. Some people really hate them. So just as long as you're up front about the fact that there's a love triangle in it, then I say do it. <laughs> Anything in it down there? Yeah. I feel like this is kind of like the whole let's all hate Twilight thing too, but I like love triangles too. I think that if they're done right, they can work really well. Like, I think they got the bad reputation they did because they were being maybe overused and not done trope. well. Right. Yes. Right. Trope without think, twist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if you're going to do it, like mm -hmm. just make something different about it or at least make sure it's really working well. I agree. Sense. Yeah. No, I agree. Oh, yes, I'm done. <laughs> Another question. Go for it. Sorry. Do you approach the romance any differently if it is a, just if it's not the main plot of the book, it's just an element of the book? Oh, is the rom I'll repeat this for everyone back there. Is uh, do you treat romance different if it's the main plot versus the subplot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, like, so my yeah. paranormal romance, it's, you know, she's always very super aware of the love interest, you know, and she's always very aware of where he is. Whereas in my dystopian YA book, it's like, she's trying to save the world, but every once in a while, she's like, oh, look at that cute face he's got. I mean, it's more, I, it's better than that, but yes. <laughs> That's why I write, I don't talk. I was going to say, my books are mystery thrillers, so romance is really a subplot in all of my novels. And so, yes, I do, tr I do treat them differently. Um, and they are kind of the, the fun part of the book. And, and so the sex and all that really is, isn't there much because it's really the, the side plot of them. And it's important because it really adds to the whole suspense and the thrill of why these characters are, you know, doing what they're doing. But yeah, it's still very, very important and, and adds to it, but it is definitely a subplot. Um, when you're writing just plain romance, the romance is the plot. And so pretty much every scene you write can be about developing that romance. And, and, and some of the things that would be a, a regular plot, maybe there's a, spli a spy plot or something else, those are, those are the subplots. And so those scenes need to develop the romance, whereas when the romance is the subplot, the romance also needs to um, support and further the regular plot. Um, so it's just, I think it's just a matter of how many words you can devote to it and how you can, if you have an entire romance novel inside of another novel and it kind of detracts from the main novel, you're going to end up with your readers feeling really like jumbled and confused. Um, so as long as your subplots are supporting your main plot, then I think you're good. Ditto. <laughs> hey, I'm oh, sorry, I had to hand over there. Oh, um, so you guys kind of touched upon this already, but when trying to write a successful novel that really stands out that's romance, what are some good like tropes or cliches to avoid so it doesn't become redundant? Okay, which tropes should we avoid to make a good book? Secret baby. Oh, a secret baby. <laughs> I mean, again, I feel like if you take a trope and you make it different, I guess then it's not a trope anymore, but like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say like, stay clear of tropes because they're going to make your book predictable, but if you, like, pick a trope that you really like and then make it different and make it work for your book, I guess. Yeah. Just try to avoid them, period. You know, I mean, try to be original and, and be creative and just write what comes to you. Um, I think tropes can be really useful, um, but they become very flat when you don't have the characters to support them. So I feel like if your characters are really dynamic and they have good relationships, you can kind of get away with <coughs> some things that you might not be able to if your characters are flat and boring. Okay. 
I'll just say that tropes exist for a reason, you know, that you see them happen over and over because, I mean, us as readers, we do like them to some degree. So if you're going to use some kind of a trope, just make sure you make it your own and that you do it really, really well. So that's kind of all I have to say on that. And I'm so sorry we are out of time. I was going to get to your question, but... I'm getting the, the, the cut hit. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for coming. Yes, thank you.